Thank you very much, Sean, and thank you for being here. During the next half an hour or so, I will speak a little bit about what we're doing in terms of time series research and deployment. Today, we're going to be speaking about a specific field in the time series world called hierarchical forecasting. So for one minute, close your eyes and imagine that you are working for the government in Australia. You are in charge of the whole Ministry of Tourism. You are the Minister of Trade and Tourism in Australia. And you constantly get, uh, or you one of your uh, jobs is to answer the question, how many tourists are going to be visiting Australia and the different regions the next week, the next month, the next year? And this is a classical time series problem where you are trying to predict future behavior based on past observations, where you are using also uh, features like the trend and the seasonalities of the series, but also including exogenous variables like economic uh, variables, weather, um, and so on. These questions are important because while you're working there as Minister of Tourism, you get called by different people that are asking you, how should we staff the airports? How many people should we put this weekend or next month? How will the economy grow nationally, but also at a state level? This is important because Australia uh, has seven states. All states have governors, and then you have zones, and you have regions. And you're interested in forecasting and understanding and being able to predict forecasts for the whole of the country, but also for each of the different states, territories, and regions. This is a classical hierarchical uh, problem where you have in total 555 series that are divided by the different levels in the hierarchy. So what would you do as uh, working for, for, for that office? One thing that you could do is try to predict at the lowest granularity, what we call fine grain forecast, and then add them up. So for example, you would forecast Sydney, Blue Mountains, Hunter, and then add them up to New South Wales, and then to the total of Australia. So the problem with that is that, as you can see here in the graph, normally lower uh, uh, series with more granularity are very noisy, are very sparse, are what we call in the field sparse time series. That is, they have a lot of zero values. So it doesn't matter which model you use, it's going to have a very hard time understanding and predicting it. So if you take that and predict it and then sum it up, you're going to accumulate errors. And when you reach the top, it's going to be a very bad forecast. You could then do top down. You could try to forecast the whole of Australia and then by some weights, maybe country size or, or total shares of tourism, divide them uh, for each of the different regions. The problem here is that, yes, the top series is well behaved in the sense that it has clear patterns of seasonalities and trends, but you're going to miss very important information of the lower series. So that doesn't really work neither. So the third thing that you can do to try to solve uh, the needs of everyone, of the president that is interested in the whole country, the governors that is interested in the different regions, is to forecast all the different series, all, all the 555 series, which isn't that much, but if you are working in a large organization and you need to do hierarchical forecasting for, for example, ASKUs that add up to brands, that add up to categories, that are to, to something else, then that could scale massively. Also, if you work in finance and need to construct uh, portfolios that are coherently, hierarchically coherent, that's also going to be a problem. So the first question that we have is, Okay, now I got appointed. How do I forecast hundreds or millions of uh, time series? And the solution is to use uh, probably, and that's what we would recommend you, one of the open source libraries that are out there. Today we're going to be speaking about three particular uh, libraries that we created at Nixla. Nixla, as Sean uh, was saying, it's a company, a startup that is building an open source time series ecosystem. We created uh, from the very beginning, libraries that had in mind scalability. So you could distribute series across different machines with backends such as Spark, Coiled, or Ray. Uh, but also uh, libraries that from the very beginning were focused uh, on making life easier to practitioners 
And uh, for us, it shouldn't really make a difference if you forecast one, 10, or 10 million uh, time series. So today I'm gonna show you how to use ML Forecast, which is the library that we created for machine learning models. We also have statistical and econometric models at deep learning models. And in less than 20 uh, lines of code, and using this machine that you see here, we were able to forecast the 555 series in less than 15 seconds. Uh, in this case, fitting a classical light GBM model. So the only thing that you need to do besides importing the libraries, now I'm at line seven, is to instantiate this ML forecast uh, class. You just pass a list of models. Here we're using uh, light GBM, but you can really put whatever model of the SK Learn family, linear regression, nearest neighbors. You could also use uh, XGBoost and we will take care of distributing that uh, computation uh, natively uh, for you. After that, you just specify the frequency that you're gonna be using, and here you can really see the power of the ML forecast library in terms of feature uh, generation. Machine learning models require some feature engineering. Normally, you have to do that outside of the pipeline. Here, you can simply define the lags and the different window operations that you want to implement, like expanding mean or rolling mean for every uh, two years in this case, which is 24 uh, months. Then to fit and forecast, you simply call the fit method, specifying the data frame that you're using, the ID, and here you can have as many series as you want, the time column, the target column, and if you have exogenous variables, you can include them too, and then predict uh, the next 12 observations, that is the next year, by calling the predict method. So now we were able to create 555 series, so it seems that everything is fine. We have done a good job as ministers of tourism. However, we got a very angry phone call from the president saying that the series that we gave them for the national level don't add up to the series that he got from the state governors. And the problem really is that the forecast at different levels don't add up. And they, how, how could they if we didn't like create a reconciled strategy? We forecasted and trained at every different hierarchy. So maybe things are not that fine after we created the 555 forecast. So what is the optimal solution? And the intuition is very simple. The intuition is to forecast at all different levels and then reconcile in such a way that uh, the forecast add up, adds, adds up. And that's what we call it the field hierarchical reconciliation. And the idea is that uh, hierarchically reconciled forecasts have this structure with the bottom series, in this case, the, the four dots that you see here, the four series, add up, uh, add up to the next level and then to the total of the series. Obviously, this graph can be as large as, as you want and as complex as you want. And I'm gonna introduce some uh, notation. So it's not really that important that you follow every single step of the, of the equations, but the intuition here is that you can describe this hierarchical structure by means of matrix notation. So here in this matrix, every row uh, represents uh, a row of the, of the graph. So the first row has uh, all ones. That means it includes all the different bottom series. Then the second row is an aggregated series. It includes the first two, these ones. The third one, this two. And then you have one particular row for every uh, bottom level. So one here, one here, and so on. This is, this is what we call the summing matrix of the hierarchical structure. And this is a very powerful intuition because if you create the summing structure, uh, the summing matrix of your hierarchical time series, and you multiply that matrix by your base forecast, then you get what's called a hierarchical reconciled bottom-up approach. So what I just uh, explained is uh, would be the same as, as doing the first approach where we forecast base levels and then we create uh, the structure based on summing up the base levels. So what's the difference with hierarchical reconciliation? And the difference is that you do a two-step approach where you first take, yes, all the forecasts at the base level, but also all the forecasts at the different uh, hierarchies and then uh, you multiply that by a matrix, a projection matrix P, and you try to find that matrix in such a way that it minimizes the variance between, or the errors between your forecasts, reconciled forecasts, and your original forecasts. And, and in reality, this is like summary of what uh, all hierarchical uh, strategies are doing. They are trying to find that projection matrix so you can have the best possible reconciliation uh, strategy. 
there are different approaches. Today, we're going to speak about the statistical approach, which is all about either minimizing the variance between uh, your forecasts and reconciled forecasts and the true values, or uh, reconciling, uh, minimizing the errors between what you are forecasting and uh, the reconciled forecasts. This tradition of thought was uh, started by some uh, prominent practitioners in the time series field. The guy uh, there on the second right is uh, Rob Hinman. He's one of the most important practitioners uh, in the field. And he and his uh, team started creating different uh, methods. So beyond some classical top-down and, and bottom-up approaches, there are uh, two very famous methods. One is called mean trace that was uh, published by uh, Wikramasurilla. And here the idea is that we are going to find uh, the matrix P, which minimizes the trace of uh, this uh, uh, variance here. So the idea is how do we find such a P that we get the least variance between the actual values and the forecasted uh, values. And to do that, we could obviously try to build that uh, manually, but that would be computationally very expensive because we would have to take the interactions of all series with all series, given that we're trying to estimate this variance covariance uh, matrix. So instead of that, you can use other uh, approximation methods to try to compute that, like for example, OLS. The other intuition is not to minimize that variance, but to minimize, look at this part of the equation, to minimize the errors between the uh, actual values and uh, the reconciled uh, forecast, which is the same as multiplying HP times uh, the, 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 the y, y hat, which is the forecasts. And here we're taking more of an empirical, if you want, approach to uh, error minimization. This method, which is called empirical risk minimization reconciliation strategy, was proposed by uh, Tajep also in 2019. And, and, and here, after doing this, we just do some uh, regularization with lasso, so it's not very volatile. Well, that sounds really hard, especially if you are working as a tourism minister in Australia and you are not really that into linear algebra. And that's why we created this library called Hierarchical Forecast, so practitioners could start reconciling forecasts without doing all the complicated uh, matrix operations that are required for uh, these methods. The only thing that you need to do is to pip install the library, and we offer a wide variety of reconciliation methods like uh, bottom-up, top-down, middle-out, ERM, mean trace, also some probabilistic ones like PermBU and Bootstrap. And how this works, and I'm gonna guide you through the code. Again, it's not more than 20 lines. We define the hierarchies. We set country, country state, country state region. Then uh, we generate with the aggregate function the, the three values that are important for us, the data, the hierarchical data frame, the important summing matrix H, I, H sorry, that I introduced at the beginning, and some tags. We're gonna use this in the next step. And here in the next step, we instantiate the hierarchical reconciliation object uh, by simply passing the list of reconcilers that you want uh, or that we would like to use. So we can use as many as we want, obviously that are available in the library, but it's really easy to specify the ones that we, that we would like to, to test. And after that, we just call the reconcile method on the hierarchical reconciliation object by passing the based forecasts that we created, the summing matrix H that we got from the last step, the tags and the fitted values that we got during the training set. And after that, we would have a completely a reconciled forecast that minimizes errors and also minimize or minimizes variance. And that would uh, make, hopefully, the president very happy and also the governors because everything would match up. But now we encounter a problem, namely that forecasting tasks are really more often than not probabilistic problems. You are not that interested in just finding one point in the future. You are rather interested in trying to understand the possible distribution of future values to take decisions on their uncertainty. And, and this is important because normally uh, errors are not uh, distributed evenly in the sense that it's probably worse if you mm, are a little bit below the actual value than if you are a little bit above. This is because if you are below, then maybe the airports are understaffed or hospitals don't have enough uh, people. 
and this could cause a real logistic or health problem. If you're a little bit above, then you're a little bit overstaffed, and yes, you, you pay that extra cost, but it's definitely better to be overstaffed than understaffed. And the same is valid for classic uh, retail problems where having lost sales is a lot worse than being a little bit overstocked on certain items. So it would be great to integrate probabilistic forecasting into our whole uh, tasks in trying to predict uh, tourism flows in Australia. Okay, now that sounds hard. And the reality is that you just need to integrate three lines, hierarchical forecast and ML forecast, and really all of the libraries of Nixla are natively probabilistic. You just need to define uh, the confidence intervals with conformal prediction. You just have to pass the levels in the same code that we showed you before. And in, in as easy as that, you can get uh, forecasts that are probabilistic. Uh, that are pro probabilistic. If you want to reconcile them, you just need to pass this argument here where you specify the levels, and then you get probabilistic uh, forecasts that are hierarchically reconciled, taking into account the underlying probabilities. So I showed you uh, what you could do with two uh, libraries of the Nixlaverse. Uh, we started seeing how to forecast many different series using many possible models very efficiently. We also showed you how to reconcile them, and then we introduced the concept of probabilistic forecast and probabilistic uh, reconciliation. This uh, last, uh, let me see how much time I got. Uh, this last 10 minutes or so, we're going to be speaking about some of the research that we're conducting at Nixla. And this is us trying to push the boundaries of, of the field. Uh, to be honest, in, in, in our practical work, we have seen great results with what I have showed you. And I would recommend you, if you're excited to try this out, to start with statistical or machine learning methods and then move on into more complicated deep learning models. But I wanted to share some of the stuff that we are thinking about. One of the problems with classical uh, reconciliation <coughs> approaches is that it has very strong assumptions about the underlying distributions. Most of the cases, the reconciliation methods, and even the models, if we're talking about statistical models like ARIMAS or other autoregressive ones, are very strongly opinionated about the normality assumption. And this is problematic because uh, if we assume normality, then the, pro the confidence intervals are symmetric. And then you can see there that we have negative values for a series that can't exhibit negative values. There, is such, so, there isn't such a thing as uh, negative tourism <laughs> in, in Australia. So that's a problem. The, the other problem is that these approaches are univariate in the sense that they don't take into account the relationship between the different series. And this is very important because this series about the real world they obviously follow certain uh, econometrical, uh, economic intuitions like uh, complementarity or substitution. So probably if someone visits Sydney, he might also visit Canberra because it's very close. But he, if he visits Sydney, he's not going to visit Tasmania and, and vice versa. This is also the case for uh, classic retail where you have uh, goods that substitute each other and goods that complement each other. So it would be great if we could somehow bring this relation multivariate intuition into, into the models. The third problem is uh, that if you start having really, really big data and you start having uh, many hundreds of millions of series, then maybe training a local univariate models, it's going to be hard because you need to distribute across many different uh, computers. And there aren't, many, but there, are, there aren't as many computers. So it's a complex pipeline. The solution that we are uh, thinking and that we are proposing is what we call hierarchical uh, mixture uh, networks. And the idea is that we are introducing a flexible and efficient multivariate probability loss into the neural networks that we have made available through the different packages uh, that I will show you. Uh, the main uh, advantage of this is that with the introduction of uh, these mixture meshes, we can't expand a vast collection of neural network uh, methods in a single framework. So the idea, the mathematical idea, intuition behind this is uh, that if you sum uh, certain uh, mixtures, like for example Gaussians or uh, 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 Poissons, then the sum of Gaussians is Gaussian distribution and the sum of Poisson distribution is a Poisson distribution. What, what we say here is, and let's focus here, is that if you have a 
uh, hierarchical structure with C is the sum of A plus B, then if you sum up the distributions of A and B and uh, A and B have Gaussian or uh, Poisson distributions, then C will also have a Gaussian or Poisson distribution. And we have made this loss all available for Poisson mixture meshes, for Gaussian mixture meshes, but also for very important uh, loss functions like uh, negative binomials that are particularly relevant if you have counting data where you don't have negative values. And uh, thankfully, we have reached the maximum number of equations, so I'm not going to introduce any more. What I'm going to show you now is why this is relevant in terms of the empirical results that we have gotten from the research. Here you can see the confidence intervals of a naive uh, approach where we are doing naive bottom-up. This is we are adding the probabilities in a normal way. And as you can see, the confidence intervals are very, very wide. They reach from 0 to, to 100. And this means that if we want to be like completely confident that the airports or hospitals are going to be properly uh, staffed, then we would have a very a wide range of staffing. If we include, uh, through the concept of composite likelihood, these correlation groups, if we include the intuition through the mixture measures and the correlation groups that the series are related, then we get uh, intervals that are a lot sharper. So you can see here they range from 0 to 40. So this would give us a much better uh, stocking or staffing uh, strategy. We are running some tests on reproducing this results, but we have gotten great uh, preliminary results uh, so far. And why, why is this particularly cool, at least for us? Because now you can do hierarchical forecasting with your favorite deep learning model in a single integrated framework. So this time it must be really hard. But as you can expect, it is not hard, and this is the anticlimactic part of it. And we made it uh, so or at least that's the, the idea behind neural forecasting, so that you could start playing with these forecasting models uh, uh, easily. So you have to install neural forecast. Neural forecast is a collection of different uh, neural forecasting methods. It has uh, recursive neural networks. It, ha it has uh, transformer-based architectures. It has some of the models that we have published, like the NBITSX and the NHITS. And it, uh, it's really useful with also a wide variety of, of tooling around it. So I'm going to show you how this would work if we wanted to train a classical LSTM with a Poisson mixture mesh. By the way, we don't recommend you using LSTMs in time series tasks. They are very famous, but they don't really perform that well. And besides importing the different uh, classes and models and distributions, what we need to do is really just uh, instantiate this model where we defined the loss. Here we're using a Poisson mixture, uh, uh, mixture mesh. Then we instantiate uh, the model telling uh, uh, the package that we're going to be forecasting 12 horizons in the future, that we're going to be using this list of models, that we're going to be using this sum in matrix H, uh, H sorry, that we defined before. This is the group level that we're passing. In this sense, we're assuming that series that belong to the same state are more correlated than series that don't belong to the same states. So here the underlying assumption is that there is a geographical relation between uh, the variables. And we're using a bottom-up reconciliation strategy. After that, it's really just the same. We pass the dot when we instantiate the neural forecast class and call the dot fit and dot predict models. What if we wanted to include another model, let's say a neural hierarchical interpolation model that is one of the, of the things that we created and have gotten great results? Well, you just need to do the same. You call the model. In this case, we're instantiating uh, uh, the model with a Gaussian mixture mesh uh, loss. And everything else is really uh, the same. We just pass the list of models here, and we can create in a couple lines of code, uh, we can train two important deep learning models that are by construction, hierarchically coherent. So wrapping up, we started by forecasting at all levels. We showed then how you could be reconciling hierarchies using different statistical methods. We then introduced the concept of probabilistic reconciliation. And at the end, we showed you some of the things that we are tripping on, namely hierarchical mature networks, which we called HINT. If you like the talk, I would really appreciate it if you could show some love on, on Twitter. That there is on the QR that takes you to, to our um, Twitter account. I will leave that for one second. See if everyone is taking his phones out. <laughs> there are some links to the 
to the libraries too, so you can start playing around with them. There is so tutorials and walkthroughs. And if you're interested in the academic part of, of the things, this is one of the papers we published with, with the people that I showed at the beginning from Monash. Also, please read uh, this book by the master, Rob Hinman and George Atanasonopoulos. And here are some references. And <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, that's the talk. So thank you very much for being here and, and listening to me.